Hello, thank you for joining us for the Friday afternoon session at the COP26 Energy Transition Hub. This session is focusing on offshore wind and skills and is brought to you by the Offshore Wind Industry Council. Um, delighted to be joined by uh, Tom Hopkinson, the CEO of Taylor Hopkinson, who will be uh, setting the scene. But before he does that, we have uh, a brief overview and message from Celia Anderson, the People and Skills Director for OIC. In March 2019, the offshore wind sector deal was signed between the offshore wind industry and the government as a world leading step forwards to drive the change and growth that was going to be needed for the offshore wind um, industry over the next few years. It was a commitment to 30% of UK electricity to be generated by 30 gigawatts of offshore wind and that was to be achieved by 2030. As you may be aware, that increased to 40 gigawatts, including one gigawatt um, of floating wind. It established the goals, the strategy, and put in place the commitments that were going to be needed by both industry and government to drive this forwards. And that, that um, certainty allowed the investment, the 48 gigawatts, uh, sorry, 48 billion pounds that was going to be needed to invest in the infrastructure to support this industry but it also facilitated the early stages of the drive from 16,000 to 27,000 people that were going to be needed in UK. A number of work streams were set up uh, to deliver these commitments, for example, aviation, uh, supply chain, innovation, but also the, uh, the one we're discussing today, which is the people and skills. To underpin the work on people and skills, we set up an overarching investment and talent group, which is um, a strategic advisory board of government, the devolved administrations, um, the, the Crown State, as well as the key, uh, number of the key players in the industry, <laughs> to ensure that we drive this forwards. There were a large number of commitments associated with um, people, reflecting the fact we need new people coming into the industry and the importance of training. There is a target set um, around apprentices, the 2.5% of the employed workforce. Also work being undertaken, establishing a, a portal which will um, support the move from other sectors, for example oil and gas. We also um, agreed to facilitate the movement of the military and uh, there will be other sectors uh, depending on the need um, as the industry grows. But the industry was um, passionate about the, the culture change that was going to be needed to improve diversity and inclusion. And as a result, sets um, world leading goals in ethnicity, as well as a goal in gender. And we're just more recently beginning to start looking at social mobility and people with disability. How do we support them in the industry, value people and make them welcome. All of this needed to be underpinned by data gathering, to measure, to monitor and to forecast but we need to make sure we're on track and if we're not, what else do we need to do to drive things forwards? That was uh, underpinned by the work that was done um, using the National Skills Academy for Rail um, Skills Intelligence Model. Um, vitally important, the Renewable UK uh, Project Intelligence and also the, the work that was done by Opogee, a sector development and data analyst company. <laughs> This next day, view from me as that was the first so step. The next steps are starting to have a look at it. the critical <laughs> skills gaps and shortages. What do we need to do yeah, to address yeah, those? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it's great. Recognising that there's a change in the industry, um, the, the technology has changed. Because the average size of turbines when this was all started was um, eight megawatts, and we're now looking at fifteen megawatts being installed. The move from CTVs to SOVs, um, but also the move. Um, the, the addition of floating wind, um, as well as the, the fix that we've got at the moment, and green hydrogen um, and the electrification, etc. There's a, a lot of substantial change going on ahead of us. It's crucial, though, that we make sure that this is, um, although it's a, a UK strategy, it's driven at regional level. 
the regions are where a lot of the supply chain are based, but they're also some of the areas that are most vulnerable to climate change and also areas of deprivation. They've been impacted quite severely by uh, the pandemic. And so trying to ensure that they uh, benefit from the investment and the jobs is really important to the industry as we drive this forwards. We also need and are seeing the, the increased collaboration between the, um, the top tiers and the supply chain. And also we need to recognise that offshore wind won't happen without other enabling sectors such as transmission or construction or the marine sector. We've only just started, we've got a long way to go, but it's a really exciting path and we've got some very passionate people involved um, and driving this change forwards. But it's so important. Offshore wind is the, the backbone of the drive to net zero, but it's also our children's future. Hi, um, thanks Celia for, for that overview of the, uh, of the sector deal there. Um, so Tom, it would be great if you could build on that um, maybe give us uh, a picture of current employment in the sector, sort of foundations that we're building on and where we're going to go next. Absolutely. Thanks, Nathan. So uh, my presentation, as Nathan said, is really just to set the scene for the three um, uh, panel sessions that you'll hear later on the transition, education and culture, inclusion and diversity. So the idea of the presentation is just to demonstrate some of the findings that we found during a survey that we conducted in uh, 2020 and published in February 2021 around the current state of the market for employment in the offshore wind sector. The slide's coming up. Yeah, give it to So offshore wind undoubtedly offers uh, huge opportunities uh, for the UK workforce in very large numbers. But not only does it offer the large numbers, um, the jobs are high quality and they're in locations that really paved the way for the just transition. So the just transition of uh, the UK energy industry to clean energy um, is very central to the efforts of, uh, of the Offshore Wind Industry Council to focus on the idea that the whole of UK society has the opportunity to play a part in that transition. Next slide. Like you go back. <laughs> so, uh, as you can see from the chart here, um, current and probably future roles within the industry are split. 62% skilled technical and professional roles and 17% leadership, corporate and operational management roles. And we did a study recently and broke those down into individual job roles and there are over 200 separate jobs within the offshore wind industry supply chain here in the UK. So offshore wind is not only just about technical roles working in the offshore environment, although we're going to need to recruit uh, many thousands of those roles as well, it's uh, much more varied than that. For example, as, as offshore wind is going digital, as a lot of other industries are, there's currently a huge demand for um, roles within digital transformation, data analytics, coding, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things. And this is a new area for the sector and it's growing at pace. And there may be roles that uh, the industry doesn't even know they need yet that are going to come to the fore in the next few years. Another area of high demand currently um, is financing of the projects. As they become larger and more complex, the financing and the number of parties involved in that financing are growing. And there's a huge demand for people in this sector to come over to offshore wind. There are obviously more projects that are in development than there ever have been before. So the demand for environmental consents, permitting expertise to come and join the offshore wind industry is huge. And the world over, we're transferring to electrification of our daily lives. So as always, and in lots of other industries, demand for electrical engineering is, is exceptionally high also. So these are just a few examples. I think if you look across the variety of roles needed in the, in the sector, throughout this high demand and often thus accompanied with quite short supply. And what that means is a lot of these roles are very well paid, they're very secure, and the prospects moving forward into the future are, are very, very bright. So the roles today are reasonably well distributed around the UK, if, uh, as you can see on this next chart. Um, 
although they're currently concentrated where the existing wind farms are today. Many are located in coastal communities. This is where the centre of employment exists. And, and often, um, they are more deprived areas compared to the national averages. Areas that are in need of investment and jobs. So the offshore wind industry in the UK and, and other places around the world is tailor-made to deliver economic, economic opportunity uh, to some of the areas that need it the most. Again, uh, contributing to the just transition. It also supports the UK government's levelling up agenda, bringing investment to towns and cities outside the southeast of England. So where will the roles be in 2026? The result of the round for offshore wind auctions in England and Wales in 2021 and the anticipated results of the Scott wind auctions early next year mean that there will further be equitable distribution of roles around the UK as those roles are developed in uh, the Irish Sea, in the Celtic Sea, the far north of Scotland and the Scottish West Coast. So we'll see um, roles and job opportunities in those regions grow into the, so the size and scale that we see in Scotland, Humber and Yorkshire on the chart on your screen. Additionally, the scale of deployment today means that the supply chain will need to grow and the roles uh, related to supply chain, chain jobs will also grow and they will also likely be located in coastal communities. With additional policy change in the UK, uh, leading to more clarity on timing of when these projects will enter the water, will really enhance uh, the offshore wind sector's ability to train and develop the workforce that's required to make sure that we have the right people in the right place at the right time. So this next slide um, is just to demonstrate that uh, the growth in jobs is not just in one type or one location, it's across all types of roles in all locations. And as the more projects come online, this will only increase and increase more rapidly, enforcing again the power of the, the ability of offshore wind to contribute to the level up agenda and a just transition. So as we said, uh, just transition means trying to mirror the work in the workforce society at large. And that was the challenge set down in the offshore sector deal uh, by the UK government, government that Celia, Celia has just spoken about. And as she mentioned, this includes the workforce being made up of 33% female, 9% BAME workers, and for more than 2.5% of all those workers to have come to the industry through apprenticeships. So how does the industry go about hiring 45,000 additional workers in the next five years. It's a monumental task, and the types of roles that are required and the locations they are in, as we've seen, they play right into the hands of the just transition. However, historic uh, perceptions, attitudes toward jobs in the power sector and engineering related fields, plus where the centers of these industries have been located historically, they really don't, so they, they have posed um, some significant challenges the industry needs to address. On this chart you can see the split, the gender diversity split by region. And this survey really demonstrated that work had to be done on three key areas. Gender diversity, ethnic diversity, and also apprenticeships. So this chart demonstrates there's large variations in gender diversity across the regions and that really is driven by the types of roles that are concentrated within those different regions. Um, it demonstrated to us that um, there's a bigger uh, proportion of female candidates operating in roles such as development, consenting, business development, yet in the technical roles, as you would expect, they're uh, currently dominated by male candidates. We also found that the data gathering on BAME participation within the industry was, was severely lacking and work is ongoing today to really collect that data to achieve a baseline number as we have here for gender. And this is the final slide of the presentation. Attracting those additional female candidates, BAME candidates, apprenticeships, but just generally attracting those 45,000 people is, need, is really going to need to demonstrate that there are routes into the industry for people leaving education at all levels. 
in 2020, as the chart shows, there were 206 apprenticeships and 103 graduate traineeships. If the 45,000 additional workers we need was to be spread evenly across the next five years, and the number of uh, entry, entry opportunities into the industry remained stable, it really only covers 0.68% of the roles required. Rapidly increasing these opportunities and tailoring them to the diverse talent that we need to bring into the sector is urgent. And while we nurture this future work workforce through training opportunities, we will need to transition workers from line sectors. Many of the skills that are needed exist already. They're within tr traditional power generation, oil and gas, mining, infrastructure, just to name a few, where the training requirements are, are reasonably limited. However, mapping, analysing and fulfilling the needs in an effective manner is evidently another challenge that needed to be on the OIC agenda. So as the world moves away from fossil fuels, taking those workers that are working currently in those fossil fuel industries that will be in decline is vitally important in order to secure a just transition that we all desire. So a critical challenge of this large-scale transition, as well as providing suitable training, is to ensure that everyone feels welcome that diversity is welcomed, experience is valued, and the culture, the culture of the offshore wind industry is always seen as progressive. So the sessions today cover these three key points of training and transition, education and apprenticeships, and also culture, diversity and inclusion. There's going to be a short break now, and the first session is on transition, and I'll be led by Laura Burkhardt.
Hi, and welcome to our first session on stories of the transition. Um, so I'm Lauren Burkett, I work at Equinor in people and organisation, and I'm so excited to be here today because I also represent Equinor towards the investment in talent group of the people and skills work stream of the sector deal. So I'm here with some uh, great colleagues this afternoon, and I'll invite you each to introduce yourself. So, so Mark? Hi there, my name's uh, Mark Baxter. I work for Ocean Winds. Um, I'm head of development for the UK. Scott? Hi, I'm uh, Scott Campbell. I work for uh, Technip FMC, and I'm the strategy director for Europe. Colin? Yep, Colin Brown from Acker Offshore Wind. I'm the UK business development manager. And Hannah Mary? Yes, thanks, Lauren. I'm Hannah Mary Goodlad, and I head up the Baltic Sea area development within Equinor. So over the next 30 minutes, we're going to hear some personal stories uh, from our colleagues here around their own transition into the industry and some of the things that they feel are important for us to, to take away when thinking about the transition as a whole. Um, but before we get started, I think it's quite interesting to note the diversity that we have in our panel here today. So between us, we have transitioned in from a number of different industries. I personally transitioned in from oil and gas. Yeah, and I, I, I've spent um, 10 years in rail, followed by a stint in software development. And I spent around 10 years in uh, Scottish power in the electricity industry before moving to oil and gas. Yep, and I was uh, a weapons engineer on, on submarines in the Royal Navy before coming across to, to renewables via the onshore industry, and then I went to the offshore industry. And I guess I have a fairly similar story. I have spent half of my career in oil and gas uh, in uh, subsurface roles, and now I'm in renewables offshore wind as well. Yeah, and of course we represent developers and the supply, mm -hmm. supply chain as well. Um, and I think, you know, as Tom was saying in the first session, there are a breadth of roles available in the industry, um, from roles like mine in HR uh, to com commercial, technical, project-based roles as well. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through mm. the session. But if I can turn to you first, Mark. Sure. So you have worked in IT and rail, but you started off in offshore wind and then you came full circle. Yeah, so. it's, a, it's a little bit of a story. I, um, I've spent 10 years in transport and rail um, in varying roles and mainly towards the end of that on large infrastructure projects. So both in the early engineering phases, through the procurement phases, into construction. And from there I went into offshore wind and I was lucky enough to, to develop the Dogger Bank projects uh, uh, with, a, with a great team there. But after that I, I flipped out of offshore wind again and went into software development and worked for five years in a software development company. A whole different, wow. different yeah. set of skills required for that. And then I, I, I came back to offshore wind. And one of the things I've learned about, about that experience is you know, when you look at large critical infrastructure projects, there's a range of skills that are required to make those projects successful irrelevant of the industry that you work in. So from design to procurement to construction, all those skill sets are required for offshore wind, irrelevant whether it's railways, oil and gas, or any other topic. So it's encouraging for me that I was able to dip out of different industries, understanding and having the same skill sets I used in offshore wind uh, and rail and software to apply to offshore wind. So it's a, it's a good story, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think your journey kind of between industries uniquely positions you to comment on the collaboration piece which we've heard much about it this is. week. I mean when you look at the skill pinch that, that Tom's talked about across across many different industries when you think about it there's many opportunities for industries to come together to understand those skill gaps and how we actually you know work together to try and ensure that people have those opportunities in different sectors so for example in the utility sector everyone needs uh, engineers and electricians to, to, to build the grid and mm. similarly in, in software development as we digitalize and, and software development becomes such a bigger piece for offshore wind then we're going to have lots of skill sets that we need to bring in, particularly in the operation and maintenance phases of, 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 of offshore wind farms. So yes. Absolutely, thanks. Um, so then, moving over to you, Scars, can you tell us a bit about your current role and your career to date? Yeah, sure. Um, so I originally started um, with Scottish Power uh, after graduating from Strathclyde University and worked for 10 years. Way back at the beginning of the deregulation of the uh, oil and gas uh, of the electricity market and um, I worked there for a, a long time and then met a young lady who I then married who actually lived in Aberdeen and going to Aberdeen meant that I pretty much had to get a job in the oil and gas sector. Um, everybody that works in Aberdeen is pretty much related to somebody or uh, works in some way to the oil and gas sector itself. 
So when I was working up there, I got a job with um, Technip, as it was then, um, who are a subsea services company, and um, now Technip FMC. So we're a sort of a, a global leader um, in terms of the provision of energy projects, technologies, services, uh, and systems. And we've got a really deep expertise in providing our clients with a really deep understanding of subsea projects. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of in, in that subsea space and also in the new new energy space as well. How, how is that having your feet, feet in both camps? Uh, it's really interesting um, because I really believe there's a, a big opportunity um, in terms of a transitional effect from the oil and gas industry, particularly in subsea, to transitioning those skills to large-scale offshore floating um, renewable projects. I think the barriers to entry that exist in, in large-scale offshore renewable projects themselves are, are really considerable mm -hmm. and that, that could be operational, financial, project management and the complexity of that means that there's a huge opportunity as, as I see it to take people with us. Yeah. Um, many of the skills are, are already here from the, the subsea uh, oil and gas industry and I genuinely believe we can transition more and more to, to offshore renewable work than, than simply starting again with an entirely new workforce uh, in offshore renewables. I think the transition itself is actually going to be aided and speeded up by working with companies and organisations with that experience with decades worth of offshore installation in really tough environments like the North Sea. Thanks, Scott. It's quite interesting that the point that you put forward about taking people with us and, and working for Equinor, which is a broad energy firm, you know, we, we see that internally. So we have individuals transitioning from one part of the business into renewables, into our low carbon business and actually over to oil and gas as well. And, you know, Hannah Mary, do you have any thoughts about that? Because your journey has been uh, mm. quite a windy and a very good one. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a very good way of putting it, Lauren. I, I agree fully with what you say, Scott. I think, you know, this is, has to be seen as an integrated energy system in terms of technology, in terms of looking at what the customer wants, but also in terms of the people. And the oil and gas industry has a legacy of, uh, of handling uh, and mitigating risk really well. And so our safety culture is excellent. And that's been shaped and crafted over decades of, of tragic incidences, which has made us had to step up. Now, there's a lot for us to share over to the renewable space in that. And I think the, on the other side of the picture, renewables, every cent matters, as opposed to every dollar matters. And so it installs a very, uh, commercial mindset within the renewable space. So how do we transfer that commercial mindset back to oil and gas? So we need to start having this conversation about an integrated energy mix and that covers the skill set and the technology. Thanks Hannah Mary. Um, and then moving on to you Colin, so you have uh, transitioned in from the military. Yep. We know that there's a growing number of veterans in the industry. Uh, both in the UK and I, I heard an interesting fact yesterday that there are now around 20% of our workforce is, uh, are veterans and actually in the US that's up to 50% mm. potentially so what, what are your experiences of that transfer? A transfer coming across so when I yeah. came across back in, in 2008 I kind of fell in at the role um, so I'd, you know, right place right time yeah. um, so for me it was it was fairly easy I think People even now, though, they hear a lot about the, the, the benefits of the industry. It, there's a big buzz around the renewable industry. But what we have to remember as an industry, when people are leaving the armed forces, they can't just give a month's notice or three months' notice. They have to give 12 months' notice. So there's 12 months of nervousness for these, these people coming across. Um, they probably never worked in City Street before. Mm. So they've got to, I don't want to say sympathetic, but we, but we do have to be, as an industry, slightly sympathetic. To, to their background and and their 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 mindset and how they, you know people people even so just for you for, 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 so there's like fourteen thousand people leave the armed forces every year mm -hmm. um, and there's some great skills within there you've got engineers you've got leaders you've got strategic mindsets um, but they might not be able to write a CV so we've got to consider how we can attract them to the industry how we can find different ways of working with them to bring yeah. this huge potential resource into the industry. If we're a grown industry, we need to attract really good people. And there's some excellent people leaving the forces that could be a real asset. 
to you've the, actually to the been involved um, in the new initiative, haven't you, around the military working group? Do you want to tell us a bit about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I was working with I've been working with Celia, who, who introduced herself earlier on. Um, so we've set up the let's get this right, the OWIC military working group, um, an acronym and an acronym. Um, and yeah, the idea of this is to really work with with both industry to find the opportunities for, for veterans leaving and um, mm -hmm. support veterans yes. transitioning across um, and also work with industry as well to educate industry, find where some of these, these challenges are within the recruitment process and, and find ways through, promote models, promote best practice to industry, try to generate some guidelines. So there's a group of about, uh, about 12 to 15 of us, uh, most of us are veterans um, who have got together and, and where we're starting to starting to drive some of this stuff forward um, for, the, for the benefit of the industry. Um, Sounds like an excellent initiative. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more, as I'm sure everybody yeah. else is. I mean, I think it's really interesting, isn't it, when you think about what will make our industry better and grow. And I think the diversity of employment and diversity of experience in all different industries, whether it be military, oil and gas, railway, you think to try and bring all these different components of people's experiences together and actually take it and value it and actually apply it to offshore wind is a great opportunity that we shouldn't lose. And I think we need to find ways to break down some of these barriers if they're existing for people to transition into our business. I think we have to accept we can't just recycle the offshore wind experience within the group of our businesses right now. It's time for us to try and be more proactive and more willing to, to take people and adapt to their skill sets. And, and we have to be realistic. There are small changes that you have to make to join into offshore wind, but we shouldn't make the hurdle too high. We have to try and adapt and try and make sure it's possible for these individuals who want to come and work in offshore wind. So Martha, you, know, you said it there, we need it. It's not, it's not, it's not a luxury. We need, we need to do this yeah. if we want to create this growth industry that, that the UK needs. And there's no option. We need to find good people, bring them in, help them transition, whether it's oil and gas or military, or you know, from wherever, people who just want to get back into work. We've got to create the, the roots in for them. Um, mm. and, the, and the beauty of our industry to some, de you know, to some degree is that you know, we have big, big construction projects which create a raft of opportunities around them. So not only are we directly affecting the workforce, that you know, we create many other industries that are able to, to flourish from the fact that offshore wind is developing. And so you know, it's critical that we have a pipeline of projects, and I think that's a theme that everyone has been talking about very much, but it is critical that we do have that pipeline so that we can encourage other companies to form around us. Mm. Um, and, and, and the other thing I just wanted to mention was that you know, a lot of our projects are in remote locations off the, off the north coast in deep water, whether it be floating, but we will be setting up operation and maintenance spaces around very remote areas around the country. We've set up one in Fraserburgh recently for the Murray East Offshore project. We have one going in Bucky where we're going to create employment opportunities for many, many people. And I think you know, we have to be able to tell stories about the development phase of a project, the construction phase of a project, the operation and maintenance phase of a project, what types of skill sets we need in each of those specific areas. Absolutely. And I think that you've actually both got really to the heart of what the People and Works uh, Skills Workstream is about and the work that we do in the investment talent group and the subgroups that sit underneath that. We, we spend so much time discussing and digging into that um, and the skills intelligence reports, which we're actually you know, submitting data for again to be released early next year, looks to go some way into developing that storyline, developing the picture um, and actually holding us accountable to the targets that we've said that we will uh, adhere to as an industry around diversity as well. Yeah. Um, it was interesting, one of the things Hannah and I were mentioning earlier is that when you're at school you get told to, what, what was the, the phrase you used? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can remember what, <laughs> what I was told at school. <laughs> um, you got asked the question, what university do you want to go to? Yeah, yeah. Instead of being asked, do you want to go to university? Yeah. And so we're, we're approaching this in, a, in completely the wrong mindset because mm -hmm. I, I, I went to university, I had a great time and I very much enjoyed my time at university but we need to do everything we can to guard against this energy transition becoming a middle-class academic mm -hmm. project mm -hmm. because here's the thing if you understand something you can be involved mm. and if you understand if you are involved you can make a change mm. and so we really need to increase the amount of practical applications of net zero I'm mm. talking apprenticeships I'm talking trades I'm talking skills and we need to encourage young folk to be thinking about those vocational pathways. Having a degree is fantastic, but it's not for everybody. And I think we need to be balancing out uh, the attractiveness of both 
graduate schemes and apprenticeship schemes, yeah. and also you know middle middle career uh, as well, which we've talked absolutely, about. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's um, we hear a lot about graduate programs. We need to start seeing more apprenticeship programs, yeah. for more transitioning programs created to allow people to come across. And it's not just about developers like like most of us. It's actually about the whole industry. You know, yeah. there's there's I mean, a I massive supply chain mm. behind this, yeah. and it's it's you know. It's not just yeah for a couple of years. This, this is yeah for decades to come. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more about um, university and university education. I remember um, when I was very young, my mother and father saying to me, you know, go to university, and like any good rebellious teenager, I decided to go to work. <laughs> um, and then five years later, I decided, well, no, actually, I, I should go and do something. But I, I, I look at everybody that, that comes into our organisation. Uh, and it's not on the it's not on the university degrees, and the, it's about their passion. Yeah. And I think a lot of it in renewables, there's a greater passion that I'm seeing in renewables um, to want to work in this industry and to want to make a change and to want to do something good. Mm. I think for many folk coming into this industry, Scott, the passion is there because it's it's personal. Mm. You know, for 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 my generation for, and for the younger generations, climate change is personal. It doesn't get much more personal than this. And so trying to find vocations for that passion and making it accessible for everyone to put that passion into making a change, the accessibility needs to increase. It cannot just be through a university pathway. I agree, and I, w and I wish that opportunity existed for me because if I was told that I could earn money and, 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 earn, a and earn a trade, I would, I would have certainly have done it. It was certainly, university was the highway and that, there was no other way at the time I was here. And I think as, 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 a, as an industry, we're starting to try and create more opportunities, all the different levels of, of entry, so from apprenticeships to graduates to, to you know, m transferring skills across. I think we just need to be able to map that. And I know, I know we're doing it through, through the OIC work at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you know, the, the skills, the roles, and creating the right opportunities mm -hmm. is so important for us as an industry and, and the collaboration that we're going to need to actually to get there and to map uh, map as an industry what those skills look like in terms of what's coming down the line in terms of projects and things. Yeah, because I think that's a big point. It's when the skills are needed as well. Mm -hmm. We need to identify the gaps ahead of the gaps appearing. So when when I get contacted on, on LinkedIn or, or my mobile by, by people leaving the forces, I can point them in the right direction, give them that sound advice. And it's about working together as an industry. It's a very competitive industry in some areas, but actually with something like this for the industry to succeed. Um, we need to collaborate, we need to work together, and yeah. obviously that's mm. where... And then we need to signpost. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think it goes beyond our industry walls as well, Colin. Yeah. It's, it's actually looking at this holistic picture, working with the colleges, working with the universities to map out where we're going to be mm -hmm. in the 5 to 10 to 15 year perspective. Absolutely. And being bold enough and humble enough to realise that the solutions might lie outside our industry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If I think about the three things that have revolutionized hotels, music, and transport, it's Uber, Airbnb, and Spotify. Mm -hmm. And those came from outside those traditional industries. And the energy industry needs to be prepared that that, that actually might be the same for us. It's true, yeah, it's true. And uh, having worked in software development before and taking some of the lessons that happened there in that industry, which is marvelous to work in because you know the speed of failing fast and learning quickly and knowing what works first and what doesn't and allowing that that mindset to happen i know we we work in a very dangerous industry and that aside but for everything else you know we have to be able to work quickly innovate be willing to fail because that's part of the process and i think the software development industry and those industries have taken specialisms and applied software solutions to them have done a fantastic job of, of learning those lessons and that opportunity certainly exists here. I think, I think the, innovation, the innovation piece is an interesting one because mm. it's the, the industry is moving forward so quickly. You know, the technology is getting bigger. Everything is getting more integrated now. We don't just talk about wind farms. We talk about wind farms with hydrogen yeah. or wind farms connected through direct lines to, to industry, or mm -hmm. and uh, that just drives new skills that are required for the industry. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it's about identifying them and uh, seeking them out in other areas. Mm -hmm. If we don't have them already, some of them we won't. It's about mm -hmm. finding us being proactive as an industry and finding where we can we can attract them from. Yeah, I mean we're not the only industry that's going through this skills challenge at the moment. There there is others, and, and we talked about it earlier. How do we how do we start to engage with, with with specific industry sectors to understand you know their skills challenges and our skills challenges? You know there is an industrial strategy across the UK and Scotland. It's not just the, our particular strategy that we've got. So all of us must be thinking similar thoughts. 
but you know, if we if we start to think about it together, then there will be a, 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 a I think there'll be a greater opportunity to, to find a pathway for people into different different sectors like ours. Yeah. Absolutely. So that that continued collaboration is key, and I, I think we could have sat here and, and talked all day about the skills piece. It's a, such an important topic, which our colleagues running the se sessions after us will continue to build on, um, and the importance of the diversity and inclusion within that. So. Um, it's been a real pleasure to speak with you this afternoon. Some very, very interesting insights and um, we look forward to hearing more from the, the following sessions. Thanks so much. We're at Silverstone for the Green Power final today. My father.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Ajay Alawali. I'm very pleased this afternoon to welcome you to Glasgow and COP26 here at uh, the brilliant studios here. Um, today, we're going to be talking about education, what that means in the whole sort of uh, just transition and, and sort of uh, skills part of, of uh, offshore wind and renewable energy. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Agata Muscata, who's a um, uh, knowledge uh, you might have to help me out here Knowledge again. exchange fellow. That's the one, thank you very much. <laughs> and Jim Brown from ESP. Now, um, one of the things we're going to do is just sort of um, go through each, uh, each one of you and learn a bit more about your story. So, Agatha, please, please tell us a little bit more about what you are about and, and your story, please. Thanks. So, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Agata Motskute. I'm a Knowledge Exchange Fellow at the University of Hull at the Energy and Environment Institute. Um, yeah, I'm an engineer by background. It, it was a little bit of a random story because um, my dad's a musician, my mom's a housewife. I don't have a pitch and I didn't have a family to house, <laughs> housewife at. Um, so I had to choose my career by myself. Um, I was good at maths. It, it came easy to me. Um, I was not quite as good at physics, but I really enjoyed the feeling of, oh, that's how it works. Yeah. So I was choosing what to study and we didn't have any engineering GCSE or engineering A level, so I didn't. It's quite embarrassing to admit I didn't know what engineering was. So I was quite lucky that a friend of mine from physics A levels said that her father is a civil engineer, so she's going to be studying civil engineering. And I'm like, oh, let me research what is that. Yeah. Um, and that sounded fantastic, like contributing to these, using the maths and physics to build these amazing buildings that are behind me here. So architecture was like your first yeah. love and, and buildings and, and that sort of thing. Architecture felt like I would need to be very artsy and I was very technical. So I thought engineering is fantastic. Yeah. And then this concept of generating energy from wind, solar power, things that are just out there, so it seemed amazing to me. So when I was choosing what to study, I was torn between civil engineering and energy engineering. And I finally found a course um, in civil and energy engineering where I didn't have to choose at the University of Birmingham. Yeah. So from Lithuania, I came to the UK to do my undergrad in civil and energy engineering. I spent two of my summers um, in a, an, in an engineering consultancy doing civil engineering work on side projects of uh, high-speed railway, which was amazingly exciting, uh, doing actual work that you know is going to be implemented in the future. But for my uh, final year project, I was sort of seduced into um, doing an energy-themed project. Yeah. I was doing um, urban wind flow for wind turbine positioning. So I had to do a 3D uh, model of my university campus and um, simulate wind flow through it to see where it would be the best to place an urban wind turbine. And that sounded so exciting that I was like, huh, there are potential, potential ways to keep on studying and creating something like this. And my thesis supervisor, um, mentioned this PhD program, an international one, yeah. and it, ha uh, it was fo focusing on everything wind energy related, from acoustics to uh, structural parts, um, urban wind flow, uh, onshore wind, on offshore wind, and I felt like offshore wind is the area that is expanding the most, so I decided to choose a PhD in offshore wind. And that was in, I remember we were talking before, that was in Milan, was that It right? was in Florence, Florence, in Italy, so I actually got to Actually one of my favorite live. cities, actually, it's yeah. a beautiful city, Florence, yes. It's a gorgeous place. I got to live in Florence for three <coughs> years, doing research on offshore wind. Um, it was simulating ocean waves and their in, uh, interaction with the structure and the resonant phenomena that occurs. So, so very, very much an, uh, the academic route, and, and as yeah. part of the session today, we're talking about, um, and in relation to actually some of the, the points made in the previous session about those routes into renewable energy, and, mm -hmm. and I think your story is very much an academic story. So Absolutely. you were doing your PhD at Florence yeah. uh, University, and then you made you came back to the UK. Tell, exactly. tell us more about what you're doing now. So uh, I'm based at the University of Hull now, and that was sort of a natural transi transition. My PhD was on a very technical, fully nonlinear wave model which I realized that industry cannot use because it's too computationally heavy. Um, and I felt I wanted to do something more directly related to industry. Yeah. And University of Hull is placed in the Humber where the largest offshore wind developments are happening. And they have such close ties with different industries that I thought if I go there, I can work a lot with industry. And my 
uh, next role was working on knowledge exchange, creating a tool, uh, translating academic advances into industry um, appealing findings, short summaries of academic papers for industry to quickly capture uh, what academic advances have been made. And, th and this is what I, l I love about when, again, when we spoke about what you were doing, I think this represents such a good link between industry and academia, where mm. you've got some really smart people working on very specific issues, which industry can then take forward and, and actually implement to, to see that story of offshore wind improve and to lower the levelized cost of energy and to expand as we've seen. Um, would you say that there's, um, you mentioned the Center for Doctoral Training as well, did you, did you want to mention anything about that? Yes, yeah, so um, I did my PhD in uh, Europe, in an international PhD, but then I heard that in the UK there are such things called Centers for Doctoral Training, which um, sounded like such an exciting thing to do, and at the University of Hull there is an excellent one called Aura Center for Doctoral Training, yeah. um, but there's uh, different ones on offshore wind scattered all around the UK, so Centers for Doctoral Doctoral training um, are where you come in and you get uh, a year of taught course and then you focus on your PhD uh, together with a cohort of other uh, PhD students doing this research and you get a uh, doctorate at the end on the topic that you're most passionate about. Uh, and again from what you described here because geography is, is part of this, this, mm. this offshore wind story and renewable stories is connecting those different parts of the country and different universities and, and seeing how those different specialities can, can be spread. So. Yes, I mean, to, to those who are, who are out there thinking about the academic route, I really encourage you to look up these Centre for Doctoral Trainings and, and to see perhaps if you if that is... And it's never too late to come into it. Yeah. Um, on this Centre okay. for Doctoral Training, we have people who came after years in industry, uh, who came um, after having children, uh, who came from different sectors, who came straight out of Masters or straight out of Bachelor. Or so there's no right way to join a Centre yeah, for Doctoral that, Training. Yeah, thank you, for, thank you for that, because I think that was the, that was the point, again, in the previous session people were making is how actually you might have worked in a different industry and and that route in terms of coming into offshore wind or indeed re renewables that can have lots of different uh, they can take very different forms and yes and I think with that what I'd like to do is, is introduce Jim so Jim can you tell us a bit more about um, who you are maybe a little bit about your story and, and, and how you're where you fit in this great picture of education within renewables Hello everyone. Uh, yes, mine's is a very different story. Uh, I'm, a, I'm from a very working class background uh, at school. I had the conversation that we heard earlier, which university are you going to? Uh, in, my, in my family, university was not part of the conversation. It was, mm. you were 16, you went out, you got a job. Yeah. So I went and did an apprenticeship. Uh, which is which is great because one of the themes today is around apprenticeships and, and it's fantastic that the industry has got such a, a target for this and, and a drive for this. So uh, that that was the best thing ever for me. Uh, the, the apprenticeship was uh, fantastic. It was with Scottish Gas, uh, which became British Gas. So the, the energy link there, but it was actually in the fleet side. So it was yeah. actually the, the very much a mechanical technical role. So maintaining the fleet. And the Scottish Gas, British Gas, gave me a fantastic education. Uh, and on the back of that, when it was when it was being privatised, uh, the transport was being uh, outsourced. Yeah. And just one day, uh, I was saying to one of my friends, Is, "Are there any jobs in the in the paper?" And they said, "Oh, there's a lecturer's post in Perth, so I'm going to apply." And at the age of 23. <laughs> You became a lecturer. I became a lecturer. Wow, OK. <laughs> and then I went through quite a quick succession of promotions and, and round the number of colleges and, and became a, a head of department very quickly. So I think it was about 29, 30 when I became a head of department uh, in, a, in, a, in a college, yeah. uh, heading up the automotive section. And, and from there, I was, I was doing my master's at that point, and a secondment came up with the Sector Skills Council at the time, so it was actually the National Training Organisation, the predecessor to Sector Skills Councils. So I applied, and uh, it was a, a part-time secondment, which my, my company supported, went along for the interview, they offered me a full-time post and a company car, so I, oh, I'm going for this. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fantastic and never looked back. So that became the Sector Skills Council. Mm. Um, then I, I, I was doing the Sector Skills Agreements uh, in, in Scotland, which was a thing that, that every Sector Skills Council had to do this and, and with every government department agency. So I did it for Scotland. And then I was headhunted by Ener Energy and Utility Skills. So they'd, the gas, the water, the, the power sector, so I was headhunted by them, so I went in there uh, to do basically the same. And 
I was, I've always been passionate about the environment and the, the green energy and the, yeah. and, and the skills. If, and if, if you don't mind me saying, I think that's one of the other points I touched on. You know, today we do, we, do, we do often talk about young people who feel passionately about climate change, but I think there is something to be said for people of lots of different ages who feel about, you know, feel a passion for oh, it. Yeah. People coming from different sectors, and I think, you know, it's not exclusively to young people, right? I mean, a lot of people feel passionately about this and want to have a, a job with purpose. You just have to look around the, the sector. I mean, the majority of people who are in the renewable sector are really quite passionate about it. I think yeah. that's one of the really attractive things about renewable energy, uh, particularly for youngsters. And that's something we really need to, to pitch to, to inspire youngsters, to, to enthuse them, yeah. to make the right choices, to, to actually to, to look at a, a, the energy sector as a career of choice. Um, there's a lot of negativity around oil and gas, but, re but renewables does capture youngsters' imaginations. Yeah. It is Everybody's green, it's thinking, what can I, uh, uh, there's so much talk about eco-anxiety and even eco-anger, and this is one of the things that you can definitely do, each individual can. <laughs> definitely. And, and we're sitting here in COP, so yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have to be enthusiastic about that. Um, but then Jim, tell me more about ESP, what's it all about, and, and how, are you, how do you fit in that story of apprenticeships, which we were talking about before? Okay. So. Uh, when I was at EU Skills, uh, I actually got involved, I, I pushed the renewables agenda, the EU Skills, you know, we've touched on this, it's not for us. So I built it into the sector skills agreement. Um, and on the back of that, we, they, they made me head of renewables <laughs> for the UK. And they seconded the Scottish Government on the back of that for a couple of uh, days a week. And one of the key things we did was, we, I was actually involved with Renewable UK, with industry, and we developed the first wind turbine apprenticeship. Now, I, th I was calculating that today, I think it was 12 or 13 years ago, mm. the first apprenticeship was launched. Uh, it was The first pilot was in Scotland at, at Fife College, it was Carnegie College at the time in the south. I followed that, that pr apprenticeship from EU Skills. I went there to work to see that apprenticeship through. Uh, and then through, the, the, uh, through my work with the Scottish Government, I wrote in that the, the colleges and universities had to work together to support the industry and look at these new emerging skills. Mm. And on the back of that, and a, a year later, the, the e e Energy Skills Partnership was established. Uh, I was asked to apply. I was successful. So I, for, I've now been doing this for 10 years, yeah. uh, really driving it. It's, it's expanded, so it's, it's more than energy. But the apprenticeship is really key. Mm. Uh, and I'm, you know I'm passionate about apprenticeship, that's where I came from. Yeah. But for the industry, it's a real, real opportunity to, to grow your own, to recruit locally, develop your, your talent locally, build them into your, your culture uh, from an early stage. But that can actually start at school and, and engaging through um, amb STEM ambassador programs or, or initiatives. Uh, there's lots of initiatives out there. I know you're going to touch on one, <laughs> I will do, uh, yeah. uh, But I think all of that's really key. But industry's really got to buy into the apprenticeships. They're so rewarding. They're so so much win-win for the company and the individual. Well, we heard we heard Tom speak before about the offshore wind sector deal and, it, and its goal mm -hmm. to, I think, have 2.5 percent of the yeah. workforce as apprenticeships. How are we doing? I mean, are those apprenticeships and the frameworks around it has has that been set? Is there a lot more work to do? How can other countries, um, you know, so many nations from across the world, um, you know, who knows? People might be watching this across yeah. the world. I mean, what can we sort of learn from the UK and some of the positive things we've done so far? There are some real positives in, in here. I mean, Tom did say that uh, we're, we're behind the target or where yeah. we would hope to be for the, for the apprenticeships, and, and we are. I think, but a lot of the conversation I'm having with developers and OEMs, they are absolutely looking at apprenticeships as the as the developments come through. Mm. So there's lots of really good dialogue on that. The, the sector has done a really good piece, and the, the, the people in skills, investment and talent, it's done a lot of work. The diversity inclusion has been a really good piece, yeah. uh, and that's turned around, made a significant difference. So we've, we've gone from a 13% females into, into apprenticeships to 25% in a couple of years. That's actually quite an achievement. I've, mm. I've been working in sectors where we've been trying to do this for 30 years, and they've maybe gone up by 1% or something. So that's a really, really huge achievement. And then looking at the apprenticeship programmes themselves and, and, and the, dif the different types of apprentices. So I think the industry is really open to this. And, and there's actually also the, the Energy Skills Alliance, which is, has been established, is looking at all energy apprenticeship. No, and, and 
Melanie sits on that, I sit on that, and we are looking at this all energy apprenticeship, and it's about that transferability to allow youngsters and no, don't pigeonhole them in, uh, there's nothing to do with turbine technician, or, or yeah. they could go into the gas, but then they can transition without any, any challenges, and it's a one standard. I think, I think these types of things are really interesting, uh, really a uh, necessity for, for the future. So the apprenticeships, appre sorry, after you. No, uh, apprentice apprenticeship is not either apprenticeship or academic or degree. Uh, there are apprenticeship programs Oof. which offer a degree. Yes. University of Hull is offering MSc with uh, yeah. some apprenticeships Graduate well. apprenticeship schemes are there. Foundation, we, in Scotland we have foundation apprenticeships for school, yeah. school pupils. Uh, students they are now, uh, but then the, the modern apprenticeships, we have the graduate mm -hmm. apprenticeships, so they're very, very versatile and actually the gra graduate apprenticeships are, are fantastic uh, yeah. uh, in allowing people to work and learn at the same time and work I think towards their degree. That, that idea of working and learning I think is such a valuable thing. I, I, so powerful. I, I, I actually, um, when I was a, I was sponsored through my degree as well, I'm extremely grateful for that. I mean, we talked about transition and I sort of started off in the, in the defence industry and I remember I went down the academic route and did a, a master's degree at, at Loughborough University. And, but there were a couple of friends who actually, rather than doing A-levels or what was the traditional academic route, they'd actually done their H&Ds, HN, I think it was. Yeah. And they, they'd actually been working on the aircraft. And it was, <laughs> I was like, as a kid who built air fixes and wanted to work in, you know, work in the aviation industry, I was extremely jealous of, of two of my friends who had literally you know, as when they were 16, 17, we're literally building aircraft and then had then come to university yeah. and then we're getting sponsorship Absolutely. as well. And I, yeah. and I always thought there was, a, there was a beautiful story in that and how you can work and learn at the same time, which I think is an extremely powerful thing. And, and hopefully we'll see that, and we are seeing that emulated in, in the UK, but perhaps other countries can learn from that story as well. Uh, absolutely, and, and, there, and there's such a broad range of apprenticeships as well, so it's not just about yeah. engineers and technicians, they're financial, there's, there's you know, HR, there's admin, the industry needs a whole workforce, it's, yeah. not, it's not just about that. And there's a whole transition piece we need to, we touched on the transition earlier, but we need to get the transition programmes industry recognised and support these people for, through career changers or upskilling or, yeah. or it's lifelong learning isn't it at the end of the day we need to all progress and we, all, we also live in a, in a world now where people might not necessarily have the same job that they start off with you know things are very dynamic and it's not just climate change but you know we, we've heard two stories where you know within very short periods of time people have significantly changed their careers now one of the things I wanted to touch on um, you know as part of the education piece here is is and the fact that it, um, there are a lot of young people in, in, in the city today is, is that around how we engage with, with young people and inspire young people to come into offshore wind and indeed, and indeed renewables. And you know, I've had the pleasure of being introduced to a, um, to a uh, fantastic uh, charity called the Green Power Education Trust, which we're gonna see a video, video on in a, in, a, in a minute or so. Um, actually through Dudgeon Offshore Wind Farm that I, uh, that I worked, uh, worked on. And we had a great community fund there and, and the, the guys came in and did a bit of a pitch and, I rocked up on, on the day and went, went to Heffel Racetrack and uh, Lotus's racetrack, brilliant motorsport his heritage in Norfolk, which I didn't realise, but to, rocked up to this race and it was abysmal weather, but the passion and the enthusiasm that these children had around these electric kick cars that they had actually built and tested and, and were about to race was, was absolutely phenomenal. So, and the whole, the whole purpose around that charity is to engage young, young people uh, into uh, sort of STEM subjects, yeah. but it does expose them to other things like budgets and accounting because they have to manage all of that stuff, as well as the creativity aspect of it. Because when you see these things turn up, the well, they look absolutely astounding. It's like it's like, carn like carnival, you know, at the same time. So, um, I think we've got a short video which we're going to hopefully just bring in here, but uh, just as an example of uh, how to and get them excited about STEM subjects. We're at Silverstone for the Green Power final today. My father started the whole enterprise 20 years ago and he came up with the idea of building an electric car, pushing kids into engineering, encouraging them to get involved. We're celebrating our previous 20 years and also looking forward to what we're doing in the future and how we're growing and expanding green power. We have teams from all over the world here today and whether you're a Chinese team sitting next to a team from London, everyone's working together. I mean, there's 100 cars here today and it's it's just amazing to see all the people who have the same interests as you. And the addition is going to be really slippy, so it means you have to go a bit slower, a bit more sensible, but it means that everyone else is going at the same speed, so you can really overtake and make ground. It didn't go off to a good start because our gearing was a bit off, 
and then uh, we went out and it wasn't working but then halfway through our car just started going really fast and now everything's good. There's so many things that it does for us. It's just a lot of fun and it's just a really good way to get lots of people into engineering. It was fantastic to finally put something that we'd created onto a racetrack. It's been really fantastic to see this community grow and just the more, the more young people we can get involved in a project like this, the better because the amount that I personally have got out of this is something that I have to thank Green Power for massively. I think it's really important to bring um, women and girls into the motorsport environment. The thing that inspired me was that I saw the impact that it had on the girls around my school and I wanted to take part in it to be a part of something bigger. Green Power is really important because in terms of a, a discipline for kids to actually improve their skills, I can't see anything better. You've got costing, budgeting, engineering, you've got resource allocation, you've got operations, you've got logistics, there's so many real world aspects that you must consider and, and, and do successfully to get on track, it's such a good practice for these, for these children. I think the big push is to get it more international, get more and more children involved in it, make it as inclusive as possible. And 20 years from now, who knows who could be sat in the cars. Green Power makes a difference because we're an involved challenge. It really takes some effort to get here and because it's so involved, it really seats it in the young people. As you can see, really, really inspiring video there. I get chills just watching it, uh, especially when it's at Silverstone. So can you imagine just you know, racing around the track with all the heritage there? Um, I, I think have gone into mechanical engineering, I think, if yeah. I had. <laughs> Maybe me too. That was me. <laughs> I think um, you know, one of the things I wanted to just uh, add in relation to that is, is how we do see how, um, indeed, you know, when people are trying to, or young, young people, when they're thinking about what prospective careers they want to do. You know, obviously that stems back to what subjects they need to study. I think the studies do show that actually some of those um, biases are already established when, yeah. not when they're nine years old, nine, ten years old, and it's, you know, it's the idea of perhaps a young girl who thinks that engineering isn't for them, and what we want to do is, is actually completely change that mindset and say, look, doesn't matter what your gender is, doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, doesn't matter where you are in the country, these opportunities are available to you if you're willing to put the hard work in and you've got the passion for the subject and as we've described different routes are possible for different people so just engaging um, um, young people in those topics uh, is you know is something that I think we all feel very passionately uh -huh. about absolutely yeah, yeah. So for, for us uh, Adji, we, we, we administer the, or support the Scottish Government STEM strategy in Scotland. We, we support a, a network of regional STEM partnerships which yeah. covers the whole of Scotland. The, the colleges who are our members, they, they, they lead on these projects but it's got all the relevant partners in there and they, they're developing action plans and strategies for their regions yeah. and there's core, there's core members of that which has got to be the government agencies and education departments and, and Education Scotland but every, every partnership is different because it's got to be meet the needs of that region, the yes. economic needs, so the, the employer membership, etc., is really, really key. I think, I think it, it, it's phenomenal. And we, we do, I mean, we, work, we, do the, we do the Green Power and support the Green Power. We, we also support the First Lego League, uh, IET's First Lego League. It's fantastic. It's four to six year olds, it's six to nine year olds, and, and nine to 16 year olds. And it's programming, it's teamwork building, it's all these soft skills. Mm. And the gender balance on all these things that we've got, it, it's absolutely pretty much, I think it's 49-51% or 50-50% on everything we do because we don't, we don't try, we're going early and we don't try to stereotype or anything, it's just come along, have fun, <laughs> learn, but it's actually very, very empowering for the individuals. It is, it's, it's mm -hmm. fun and it's problem, problem solving and once you try it and you have fun you with get it. Hooked. They're hooked. You're hooked. <laughs> Absolutely, and as, as long as you have role models, you can see other people like you doing this yeah. in the world, it really empowers. Actually, um, we've not heard much from you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you make me blush. Um, no, well, shy. I mean, I, mean I, I, have a, I have a little bit of a story in the sense that, you know, I, I mentioned before that I worked in uh, uh, the defence industry because, you know, I was a kid and wanted to make fighter jets, didn't I? 
but uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, my story is I went went to university and actually it was a uh, a professor, my tutor uh, at the time. He was actually the, um, a wind uh, professor, and he basically I, I got into it from there. I mean, I did actually build my first turbine when I was 13 years old, just but not that I'm bragging about that or anything. <laughs> that was a while ago now as well. But um, yeah, it was just at university I actually got more interested in renewables at the, with the department that I was in, and. Um, uh, yes, slowly and eventually got into the industry in 2010. So yeah, been in it a while, and I've seen it. You know, I've seen it change so yeah, much. It was it, yeah. in the early days. It was a it was a case of making the case for offshore wind. You know, convincing people this thing, uh, this industry that we, this brilliant industry that we work in, actually had legs and actually could stand on its own two feet. And and now it's just such a, a wondrous thing to see how offshore wind is one of those big topics that people are talking about. You know, in that building just across the river right now. So I'm, you know, I'm really proud. I think you know to work in in that industry and, and to have done to have done my bit actually. One of the things, um, Jim, just briefly, um, you mentioned before was the regions, and I'm really proud of the offshore wind industry in the sense that um, there's a lot of developers and a lot of projects across the country, and often with the, with these projects, they're investing in their local communities. Yeah. And I was very privileged to work on the the Dogger Bank offshore wind farm of which um, uh, Equinor, SSC, and 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 any uh, um, a part of and. One of the great things about that project is how you know they're investing you know significant amount of money. I think during constructions, it's it's something that's, it's up to a million pounds, believe it or not. But with that project, because of that east coast of England, you've got you know the, you've got the Humberside region, you've got the Port of Tyne, you know a lot of money is going in. And as you heard me talk about my own sort of story before and how I was sponsored through my degree, which you know I was I came from a working class background as well, um, particularly you know the, the challenges and, and tuition fees I'm really proud to see how as an example Dogger Bank is actually providing scholarships and it's such mm -hmm. a such a brilliant thing that the industry is putting back into those communities and we are seeing that those those coastal communities actually you know see that rejuvenation that, that yeah. renaissance as it were and I think yeah maybe that's maybe that's one place that I can sort of just emphasize that how offshore wind is is facilitating I hope this doesn't sound too, too much that, that renaissance yeah I really I really like how we're seeing you know, those coastal communities which have been deprived for many years how we're seeing things improve we heard the speaker this morning uh, just earlier saying about the the Maury and the Fraserburgh development mm. it, it's fantastic what uh, Ocean Wind and, and the Maury project are doing up there for apprenticeships yeah. uh, for transition training as well uh, and and the whole stem agenda um, I'm, I'm working with sea green I'm work I'm speaking to all the Scotland developers at the moment so one of my other roles is the, is the skills lead for the Scottish Offshore Wind Energy Council, which absolutely aligns with the, the sector deal. Mm. But skills is unique in Scotland, so we're taking that forward and pushing that. And but, but linking in with OWIC and the Investment and Talent Group and the Energy Skills Alliance is, it allows us to kind of line things uh, better and just maximise every penny that's coming through. There's, there's a lot coming through. We just need to make sure it maximises that. I think that that's what the offshore wind sector deal has done you know via the offshore wind industry council is 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 facilitate that strategy mm -hmm. because i think until that was sort of set there was a lot of a lot of good things happening but perhaps it wasn't all coming together in the right way and and you know we've seen it in humberside as well mm -hmm. haven't we agatha there's there's a lot of there's a lot of buzz in around humberside at the moment is that are you seeing that on the because they do say it's never dull in hull and i have lived there for a year so <laughs> um city of culture i think but we had a, was it was in 2018 but I remember when there was a there was a huge blade that they just put in the, in the middle of the city centre. So there's a lot of there's a buzz in Humberside, right? Absolutely. There's the Siemens Blade Factory, and you can always see the massive blades as you're walking by or going on your jog. On the other side of the Humber, on the south side, there's the Grimsby um, Operations and Maintenance from um, the Orsted, Orsted Company. Yeah, yeah and um, it's 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 just the whole region is buzzing with with the whole decar decarbonisation agenda and, and um, offshore wind sector. And that's and that's and as you said that's being replicated across the country whether it be Norfolk mm -hmm. uh, in Great Yarmouth or Barrow or, or Port of Tyne. It's also the recognition of the clusters and the supply chain, the importance of, this, yes. of, the, of the supply chain uh, and the clusters, the two clusters we have in Scotland are so proactive engaging with the companies. I mean the, the work is starting to flow into the communities and and that if the sector deals achieve nothing else that's great but so it's, it is supporting jobs it's supporting e the economic development uh, it, it is fantastic at the moment and, and the dialogue that's now going on that never happened previously is, is second to none so i'm, I'm delighted with the, with the progress that's been <laughs> achieved over the past two three years okay well i think uh you know, it's a nice way to finish up so i, I think uh, i think we're going to call it time there but just on a sort of last note as the as the sun goes down in in glasgow um Yep, 
really privileged to be here and um, very happy to see and speak on such a great topic. So thank you very much for watching and, and look forward to hearing the next topics.
Hello, everybody, and welcome to the final session of what's been a packed afternoon on skills in the offshore wind sector. My name is Ranjit Mene, and we're going to be talking about culture, uh, diversity, and inclusion in this session. I have a fantastic panel with me, and I'd like to introduce them and get them to introduce themselves. Over to you, Jennifer. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Gomez Molina. Uh, within Vattenfall Wind Power in Business Unit Offshore, I work as a Project Management Officer, supporting the engineering and technical teams to develop competitive and innovative products for our offshore wind farm assets. Uh, for me, diversity and inclusion is quite close to my heart. As someone who was born in the UK to Colombian parents, a female who studies STEM, and also a mother trying to balance a, a career and a young family, uh, this is quite uh, an important topic for me. Within Vattenfall, I joined the Diversity Energy Network to help promote and roll out and also celebrate the initiatives that we have there. And I've been part of the Gender and, and Ethnicity Working Group as part of the OWIC People and Skills Workstream for about a year now. And uh, for me today, it's super special because due to COVID restrictions, it's the first time that I see Rakesh and Ranjit <laughs> in 3D ever. And what a day, especially at COP26. Fantastic. Rakesh, over to you. Fantastic. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. My name is Rakesh Chand, and I am the Digital Manager for the Scottish Power Renewables Offshore Business. Now, today you're going to hear of the importance of diversity and inclusion within the offshore wind sector, and the reason why diversity and inclusion is so important to ensure that the offshore wind sector plays its part within the energy transition. And I am going to showcase for you some of the fantastic work that's taking place across Scottish power within the diversity and inclusion space. Great, thank you very much. So a little introduction about myself. So I am co-founder of GTIP, we're a renewable energy developer. I've been in the offshore wind sector for more than 11 years now. And I've been in the investment and talent group since its inception in 2019. I'm also the ethnicity champion. Now, the way we're going to structure this uh, discussion today is that uh, we're going to use a mixture of slides, uh, case studies, and, and discussion. So we'll be firstly talking about the, the reason why we're doing this work and the business case for diversity and inclusion. We'll then be talking about some of the work that the investment in talent group has been doing over the past couple of years. And then we will see the great um, work that some of the developers have been doing through the use of case studies. And we will also then introduce our virtual colleague, Rob Howes from Orsted, who couldn't be here today, but who has sent in a, a video. And then at the end, we'll be talking a little bit about culture change and how important that is to drive diversity and culture uh, inclusion within the industry. So in order to start off, I would like to firstly give you some statistics. So the business case for diversity and inclusion, it's of course not just a moral imperative to increase the amount of diversity and inclusion within the offshore wind industry. It also makes business sense. You've heard from the previous speakers about the urgent need for the offshore wind sector to increase the number of people uh, that come into it in order to, to meet the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, sector targets that have been set. And in fact, we find out from lots of data within the industry that actually increasing diversity and inclusion is in fact good for business. I've picked out a couple of uh, very well-known studies that um, show this in, in, a, in a very nice uh, way. So the first study is a, a study that was done by McKinsey in uh, 2019, which compared many companies, uh, in fact, more than a 1,000 companies in, in 15 countries, and, and it kind of ranked them on how well they were doing on various financial uh, metrics. And in fact, the study showed that companies with a gender-diverse workforce are 25% more likely to outperform their peers. And it also showed that companies with an ethnically diverse workforce are 36% more likely to outperform their peers, which really goes to the heart of um, the business case for increasing diversity and inclusion. There's also another study um, which I've picked out, which is from Deloitte. And here again, they, they studied 50 organizations which um, counted for over, um, over a million employees. And there, they said that companies with an inclusive culture are eight times 
more likely to achieve better business outcomes, which really goes to show you that it's a no-brainer for companies and organizations to increase their diversity and inclusion going forward. So what have been, uh, the Investment in Talent group been doing to address this challenge going forward? I'll hand you over to, to Jennifer, who will talk a little bit about that. Thanks, Ranjit. So, yeah, indeed, what, what have we been doing? And uh, given that the targets and ambitions that have been set, you know, how have we made progress? So for us, critically, we, we needed to establish a baseline. Where are we operating right now? And in 2020, a study was done uh, for, to assess in the UK offshore wind workforce how many people uh, were, were in our targets. And uh, out of uh, 26,000 uh, respondees, uh, we established that 18% of them identified as female and 79% identified as male. So as we can see, this is, this is quite a stark imbalance. And this really doesn't reflect what our current UK population is, which is roughly more around 50-50. And also critically, the amount of female students studying STEM subjects, where we typically get our, our graduates from into the offshore wind sector. So what can we, what can we do about this? This is, this is obviously not a great baseline to start from. Also, interestingly, uh, we looked at ethnicity, and from the 26,000 respondees to the survey, only 3% identified as having an ethnic minority, uh, so non-white um, uh, people in the workforce. And if we thought the gender imbalance was bad, this is, this is another level. So what can we do about this? And this, is, this has been driven by the offshore wind sector deal which is a collaboration between the UK government and also our, our offshore wind sector, where we look at our UK companies and what can we do to make our UK companies more competitive and more productive so that they are able to achieve the net zero ambitions, but also cement the UK as a global leader in offshore wind. And so we have set these targets to be able to, as part of this offshore wind sector deal, to deliver on this. First target is from the 18% where we are currently now to increase that to 33% of female who identify as female within offshore wind by 2030 with a stretch target uh, of 40%. Also, and this was covered by Tom earlier in the beginning, to establish a baseline figure for BAME, so uh, Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic. And the data right now is really flaky. It's between 3 and 5%. And for us to be able to progress things, we need to know where we are right now. Uh, and since then, through our discussions in the working group, we have set the target of 9% um, to be uh, of BAME candidates in offshore wind by 2030, uh, with a stretch ambition of 12%. And currently in the UK, we're roughly around 14% identifying as BAME. An important thing to note here is BAME, the, the title BAME is uh, under review right now because it can, seen as, it can be seen as another tag and for us to really celebrate all our cultures and all our backgrounds, ethnicity is, is preferred for now. So uh, yes, that's where we are with the, with the offshore wind sector deal and, and us within the working group, uh, which has been a great multidisciplinary collaboration of everyone across the <laughs> sector. Two of them, well, three of us, three of our companies are here representing today. Uh, we put our heads together through, because of COVID, through various team calls, and uh, we looked at, okay, how can we capture the lessons learned, what to do, what not to do? How can we share our case studies about really good initiatives and programs that have been rolled out? Also, how can we clarify terms within diversity and inclusion? These can be very confusing. And what guidance and information can we give our offshore wind sector so that they can promote diversity and inclusion within their workforce? Um, so this, this has been a great team effort and uh, we have produced a best practice guide to be able so that our offshore wind sector, such as uh, companies, suppliers, contractors, NGOs, um, also academia and our professional institutes such as IMREST and the Energy Institute, which I'm a member of, can improve diversity in, in their workforce. Uh, so we've produced this 65-page document, and I know Ranjit and Rakesh, we've done our best to make it as digestible as possible, um, and so that it can be easily used. And uh, we've, we've captured all of these lessons learned in this document. Critically, there are four principal chapters. Uh, 
so engagement and attraction. As I mentioned before, there's a shortage of talent in our sector. We've got so much to do in our portfolio and pipeline that's coming up, but not enough people to deliver on it. So, and, and for the talent that is already in the sector, we're competing for resources, which is, which is good in a way, but it's also not productive when, you, when you've got a job to do. Another topic that we look at is recruitment. And this is where we're taking a step back to think about how unconscious bias and subjective assessments and perceptions are influencing how we d recruit candidates, especially how can we make it more diverse and more inclusive. We want to be able to recruit people based on their ability to deliver the role and not think, oh, are they a good culture fit? It's about how their culture can add to the way of working of that company. And I have to say, and I know this for a fact, my colleagues have benefited from the Colombian coffee that I brought into the <laughs> office, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I know they will going forward. Um, uh, and another area is progression. So once we have the talent in and they are happy and, and we want to be able to take them on a journey from the start of their career, early career, through to senior management. And uh, the, in order for that to happen, they need uh, to be well supported and see really, really good role models. Um, and in Vattafall, we are very fortunate because our CEO is female, Anna Borg. And she was here just yesterday signing the First Movers Coalition, which helps sectors that are typically hard to, de to decarbonize to lower their carbon emissions. And I also have to say that our management team, our executive management team, 50% is female. And also on our board, the board is made up of a third of females. So winning. Woo! And uh, we're really, really proud about that. Uh, but that's just Vattenfall. And I know uh, we have all quite a, lot of, uh, quite a bit of work to do. So going forward, uh, we've done this best practice guide and we're going to be updating it. And I think we're due to publish a new version this year. Yes. Next few months. Next few months. And also um, we're developing uh, another publication specifically deep diving into recruitment for diversity. And I know Celia is making us in the working, a working group plot and plan for 2022. <laughs> so we're currently in Q4 for 2021. So we've just got over eight years to be mm -hmm. able to reach these 2030 targets and ambitions. But I'd like to end on a call for action. So for those of us within the offshore wind sector who want to improve diversity and inclusion, please check out this best practice guide, but also reach out. Um, there are a lot of initiatives and programs out there. And I know we've had some really open and honest discussions mm -hmm. and uh, my colleagues here, we've just, they've been so generous with you know, what's gone well and what hasn't. And only together with a collaborative approach can we really address this issue with an improved diversity and inclusion within our workforce. Great, thank you very much, Jennifer, <laughs> for a really good overview of the work that the uh, Investment in Talent Group has been doing. We'll now um, hear about some of the great examples of, of work that's been happening in, in companies within the offshore wind sector through um, three case studies. Uh, one of those will be a case study uh, by Rob Howes from Orsted on, on video. But we'll start off initially um, with a case study from, uh, from Jennifer again on uh, the Vattenfall uh, DNI initiatives. Yes, so uh, within Vattenfall, we, we take diversity and inclusion very seriously. For us, it's seen as a business priority. And for us, that is led by our senior diversity and inclusion officer who has been in place since 2015. And they are leading on our diversity and inclusion strategy, uh, which was published last year. So this strategy applies to all of our markets uh, across, across all of our core countries and across our business areas. And given that climate change is a, a global thing, then we approach it as such. Now, typically, when we think of diversity and inclusion, we may think of uh, women and gender and uh, different ethnicities, but uh, diversity and inclusion in, it involves a whole, wide, a whole group and a, a range of people, as uh, can be seen in this caption, which uh, I know in my PMO team we fondly refer to as the DNI wheel. Um, and here in particular, we've looked at how to recruit differently able and neurodiverse candidates. So. We've had success in recruiting uh, candidates with Asperger's, 
where one might typically think they're hard to employ, but we've looked at the attributes that they have, such as their logistical and analytical skills, and also their attention to detail. And that is of such value to a, way, a wide range of our teams across our different mm -hmm. business areas. And not only does this candidate get a job and they benefit in that way, but the company also benefits because they help us be more efficient and be able to deliver our portfolio, um, which is really, really fantastic. So going forward, uh, I know that this is something that we are definitely focusing and looking at exploring a bit more. Uh, but in conclusion, really, for us, diversity and inclusion is not only good for business, as Ranjit, you explained before, but also people, uh, for our colleagues and the clients that we work with, and also society. And for us, that helps us deliver in our back and forth ambition of fossil free in, fossil free in one generation. So today, before uh, I came to, to Res, I was sat in a cafe and I saw the climate march. And when you think of gender and diversity and inclusion, you, you may look at, oh, how many males and females? How, what's the ethnic diversity like? But I was really warmed by the fact to see that there was generational diversity. I saw babies in prams, little babies sleeping in their little baby holders. Uh, and then some kids who were bunking off school, but I support them because they were there trying to make their voice heard and uh, make a stamp about what was going to happen in their future. It was also parents running around the kids, which was really great to see. And also uh, the elder generation wanting a better future for those that are coming after them. Uh, so yes, that's for us is, is wonderful and it made me take a moment to reflect on my everyday. So every day working in offshore wind, I'm doing it for this, for these people. And that's really fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jennifer. Yes, we were all trying to get a glimpse of Greta Thunberg today in the march, but unfortunately <laughs> she was surrounded by her own security and it wasn't possible. Um, so the next case study is going to be uh, from Orsted, from Rob Howes. And as I mentioned earlier, he couldn't be with us, but he has sent a, a video and he's talking about social mobility in apprentice recruitment. Um, so over to, to Rob, virtually. Hello, welcome to Orsted Grimsby. My name's Rob Howes and I'm the Learning and Development Specialist. I also manage the apprentice programme for Orsted. We're very proud of our apprentice programme in Orsted. It kicked off in 2017, and we currently have 35 apprentices in Grimsby, in Barrow and Furness, and also in Brightlandsea, with ambitions to grow the programme further next year. We're also very proud to say that we have a very diverse approach to our recruitment, and we currently have 25% females out of that 35 number of apprentices. It's also clear to see in the areas we operate, such as Grimsby, Barrow and Furness, and Merseyside, they could be classed as underprivileged areas. So the question we ask ourselves when we've done recruitment this year is, are we giving everybody an opportunity to succeed um, in, in this sector? Some of the people that we're engaging with may come from families of multi-generational unemployment. We even have people that can't afford to come to the interview sessions. We have people that don't have access to IT equipment if they need to do applications. So we've completely re-looked at the way we've done our recruitment this year to give these young people every opportunity. So I'm just going to go through a few of the things that we've done to hopefully lead us to a, you know, a more diverse recruitment, particularly in social mobility. We do some excellent work within STEM. We have a great relationship with the Teach First charity, which helps us get into those schools that might be seen as underprivileged. I myself actually went to a school in Grimsby that was seen as underprivileged, so I'm very proud to work with that school. We're also looking at T-levels to see where we can give people real work experience. So in 2022, we're looking at kicking off T-levels in Orsted. We also have the luxury of this amazing visitor center that's been invested in Orsted. So this is a chance for young people to come in, to experience offshore wind in a safe environment, to have a go on some cool simulators and gadgets and toys. And it really does raise those aspirations. We also have ambassadors that go out, whether it's a STEM ambassador or an Orsted ambassador, and they will go out and they'll speak to these young people. We've also got great relationships with the local UTCs, the technical colleges, particularly in Hull, Grimsby and Scunthorpe. 
And in fact, one of our apprentices, a young guy called Oliver, who's currently working on Hornsey One, is a product of uh, Grimsby Tag, which is the local UTC, because that was the route that was best for him. And he's, you know, he's, he's living an amazing life now. So my message to the, to the session today is we need to be more diverse. We need to encourage young people from different backgrounds to apply, but we also need to give everybody an opportunity if they've got any disadvantages in terms of finance or travel or digital um, access. So I think we're doing all we can within Orsted. We can always do more. And I just encourage everybody in the sector to think about the areas that we're reaching out to, the tasks we ask people to do and the, um, the aspirations that we need to raise. So thank you for listening today and hopefully I'll see you all soon. Wonderful, thank you very much, Rob. That's a great example of the work that uh, Orsted is doing up in the uh, Humberside region. Now, one of the um, uh, recommendations in the best practice guide is around bringing, um, building support networks for minority uh, people within organizations. And um, at this point, I'd like to bring in Rakesh because um, he's done some amazing work within Scottish Power in building the VIBE network. Thank you very much, Ranjit. What is more important than people being themselves and not wasting any energy or effort in trying to be someone that they're not with in the workplace? That topic is extremely important to me and it's the reason that I founded the VIBE Employee Network. Launched in September of 2019, VIBE, the Voice of Inclusion and Balanced Ethnicity, is an employee network group founded and led by Scottish Power employees. VIBE exists to value, support, and create awareness of the protected characteristics which are defined within the Equality Act, race including colour, nationality, ethnic or national origin, and religion or belief, and the hugely positive role that they can have across Scottish Power. Our mission within the network is to create a truly diverse and open environment that benefits and that benefits from the highly positive role of ethnic mixed employees at all levels within the organisation, bringing greater creativity and innovation into our business now and into the future. Our network is built on core principles, principles that we follow when we're arranging our annual calendar of activity and events. We've worked very hard to create a safe and confidential environment to allow our members and our allies to share with us experiences, opinions, concerns and ideas. A main goal of the network is also to work alongside Scottish Power Human Resources on our mem and support our members' professional development, but not just new employees which have joined the organisation, but employees which are already within the organisation. Across 2020 and 2021, VIBE provided support to develop the, and communicate the company's position on Black Lives Matter, and we held an online event on the importance of ethnic role models, which were part of our celebrations taking place within National Inclusion Week across the UK. VIBE also launched our Celebrate and Educate communication programme, which focused on raising awareness of ethnic festivities, explaining their meaning and the significance for the employees that celebrate them. VIBE is also highly active on extremely important topics such as unconscious bias, reverse mentoring, and the professional challenges which are faced by ethnic minority employees within, within the offshore industry. The message that I provide to internal individuals, external individuals that I connect with is to come and discover VIBE learn what we are doing and be inspired to lead change. There's a, a huge amount of work that's taking place across Scottish Power within the diversity and inclusion space and I highly recommend that you access an internet search engine and you type Scottish Power Diversity and Inclusion and you'll be able to, to see the fantastic work that's taking place across the organisation. I would love to hear from you so if you want to learn more, if you want to share, if you want to connect, then please connect with me at spvibe at scottishpower.com. That's spvibe at scottishpower.com. And I would love to learn with you. I would love to share with you and, and work together 
um, in, in the future. Back to you, Ranjit. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rakesh. So we've heard three excellent examples there of um, the work that's been going on and that it continues to, to go on within the offshore wind developers. Well, of course, uh, the reason we are doing this, and these are just some final words, is that we want to affect um, cultural change within organizations. And that really is key going forward if we want to increase um, our diversity and inclusion within, within the workforce, which, as we, as we explained before, is, is good for business. And one of the important ways of, of doing this is getting senior level representation, uh, b both within, uh, within gender and ethnicity, within organizations. And that's one of the key focus, uh, focuses of the group uh, going forward. Another point to note is that gender and ethnicity is actually just the beginning. We are also looking at diversity in many different ways. Um, uh, Jennifer talked about neurodiversity. We're also talking about diversity from a socioeconomic background as well. So this is really important when we talk about the, the just transition because this huge increase in offshore wind capacity and the, and the subsequent workforce that comes with it, we want to make sure that no one is left behind. We want to make sure that the coastal communities feel involved and they, and they come and work uh, for the offshore wind um, organizations. We want to make sure that oil and gas um, people are involved and come and work for the offshore wind uh, organizations as well. And these initiatives are being taken seriously within UK government. So for example, any, for any developer that wants to um, apply for a CFD now, they have to prove their credentials within this, uh, within this, um, uh, this field of, of diversity and inclusion, how they are uh, making steps and how they are, how they are uh, actively putting in place um, things to increase uh, diversity and inclusion within their organization. And we really see the activities that the Investment in Talent group has been carrying out as, as world leading, in fact. And, you know, this is uh, something that, you know, I'm, I'm personally very proud of, that, you know, this is a, a shining light in the offshore wind uh, industry throughout the world. And this is something that can be replicated throughout the world in terms of other countries that are coming in and uh, that are starting their offshore wind journey. And, of course, as a group, we are uh, very committed to further engagement. We want to hear from you. Um, so if you go to the OWIC website, there are ways of getting in touch with us. We want to hear examples from you, best practice um, examples and guides, and, and to kind of guide us to, 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 to um, um, make our activities better in the future. A famous uh, management uh, thinker said that um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And really, what we're trying to do is change cultures within organizations so that the performance improves. And we are uh, one of the best uh, performing uh, activities and sectors in, within the UK and within the world. So uh, just to wrap up, I would um, like to turn to Jennifer and Rakesh and just to kind of get some final words from you. If there were, say, one or two final things that you, know, you would say need to be done to increase uh, gender and diversity, what, what would they be? Maybe uh, Rakesh first. Yeah, I think that, um, I think um, certainly the gender and ethnicity are, are, are always tagged together, you know, when, when, when people talk about diversity and inclusion and taking the steps to being um, more inclusive. Um, I think that there's a, a huge amount of absolutely fantastic work that has taken place across the sector in regards to, in regards to gender diversity. Um, we've started taking the steps in regards to ethnicity, but we have a really long way to go um, um, within that space, within the offshore sector. I think that there's, 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 there's certainly work to be done there. Um, some other work that certainly to be done is the um, once employees, I mean, if, if, if when employees are within an organization and they want to make a, a career within the sector, within the offshore wind sector, a career within an organization, you know the, the 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 support network that they have. You know, in order to in order to self develop, in order to in order to in, in order to progress within an organisation as well. I think is extremely key. Um, so I think I think that there's 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 a lot of work to be done within that space. Absolutely, and I totally agree about the point about ethnicity. I mean, we saw that you know um, 
you know, we've got maybe less than 3% of the, the workforce that are from ethnic minority backgrounds, and we want to increase that by three times as a minimum. And, you know, that just kind of gives you the, 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 the level of or the scale of the challenge really mm -hmm. going forward. So, Jennifer, same question to you. What are the one or two things that you would like to see happening more of going forward? Oh, just to pick up on what Rakesh said about role models. So, having more role models who are gender and diversity and inclusion diverse, for example, would be great to see so that those entering the sector can see what they can aspire to, to see that someone with the same background, same mm -hmm. culture, can do it, has made it, and have that belief that that could be me, that that could be something that I want to work with. Mm -hmm. And that way we keep them in the workforce and know that they know that there's that opportunity for them to, to move forward. Um, but also another thing that comes to mind are our support networks. So for me, I've benefited so much from these support networks. In my early career, I was, I was so tired of going into a room and being the only woman or the only one who wasn't white. And then reaching out to these support networks, it was, it was like a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. It was like, hey, people of the same background and gender as me. And knowing that you can be really honest and open about the challenges that you're facing. And uh, one challenge, the fun one of the imposter syndrome, where you, where you don't have that self-belief, but through these support networks, they've got your back. They know that you can do it, even if you feel that doubt within yourself and it, without these they it's it's difficult to progress but knowing that you've got people supporting you and wanting you to do well and wanting you to progress in your career and which is so critical for us to retain that talent as mentioned before in our sector is can only be a good thing and i have to say there's quite a few from my support network who've dialed into this session so thanks to them <laughs> as brilliant <well. laughs> thanks to them for keeping the numbers up on youtube Excellent. i think it's a it's a fantastic point in terms of role models mm. you know i mean for for young people that are thinking of getting into the sector or studying or studying in even STEM subjects, um, the the session previous, having those individuals that that you know where where an individual can say that individual looks like me, mm -hmm. you know, I can I can I can see myself within that role, I can see myself within that position, yeah. I can see myself with, with having a career within that space, you know, it's so so important, you know, it's really really important, and it's and and more so than career, etc., is a feeling of belonging, you know, within within a sector. You know that 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 um, I, I I belong within the sector. I can make a difference within the sector. You know, and um, I think that that is so important to have those role models clear. Absolutely, some really good points there. And yeah, it's it's worth pointing out that diversity and inclusion, of course, aren't the same things. You know, because mm -hmm. you can have the numbers, but then you need to have that feeling of belonging to, to be actually Absolutely. really included within organizations. And that's really the key uh, and the challenge uh, for that. And yeah, totally agree with your point about role models. And it goes back to all of the discussions we were having before about apprentices, about education. You know, if people can see people like them within these organizations, and obviously they are then m more motivated to apply and, and to, to consider offshore wind as an as a, um, attractive career option mm. going forward. Great, very good. So I think we're almost uh, at the end of time. Um, I'd just like to wrap up um, by saying that um, you may know that uh, at the moment it's Diwali where millions of, of, of people around the world are celebrating the, the Festival of Lights. And um, if I can extend the, the metaphor a little bit, um, we see light at the end of the tunnel. You know, we, we've, we're doing a lot of great work within the Investment in Talent Group. We're doing uh, you know, a lot of great work within organizations, but there is more to do. So, you know, that light needs to grow brighter and it needs to get even better and even even bigger and even brighter in order to fulfill the potential of the offshore wind sector deal and getting these 70,000 people that are going to be required for the industry. But we are, we're hopeful and I think you know uh, we, we've started on a good way and uh, we're, we're going to be making progress in the next, uh, next few years on this topic. So with that I'd like to thank my panelists Jennifer and Rakesh. I'd like to thank you for watching and um, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you.